In today's video, we are going to be reviewing the Slaves to Darkness Spearhead box. We are going to go over the savings, how this box plays in Spearhead, the rules, and a lot more. If you enjoy the content, consider leaving a thumbs up and subscribing, as well as checking the links down in the description below. If you want to join us over on Discord for a discussion, if you want to support me over on Ko-Fi or Patreon, or if you just want to check out helpful links and so on. Other guides are going to be in the pinned comment below. For example, the PDF to the Slaves to Darkness document and so on is all going to be down in the pinned comment. First up, a quick summary when it comes to the Slaves to Darkness Spearhead box. I want to say that this is the box I've probably played the most. I've played seven games with this one against stronger and weaker Spearheads, although the discrepancy between the weakest Spearhead so far and the strongest is not as large as in Combat Patrol. Uh, first up, you are getting 17 miniatures. All of this works as one self-contained regiment in full Age of Sigmar. That means that you have your Chaos Lord as your leader choice, you have some knights, some warriors, and a chariot, and it all works neatly within one regiment, and it makes the expansion of this particular box very, very easy should you want to play 1000 points games, 1500 points games, and so on, because you can just add whatever else you want, and it works. You also get a great baseline of units. Chaos Knights are very useful, they see some competitive play as far as I could see, you are getting Chaos Warriors, which are a great baseline to hold objectives and so on. And the Chariot, while being a slightly older model, still holds its own. And I think, depending on how you assemble it, can see its uses. But we are going to go over the Chariot separately in a little bit. Last but not least, you are getting approximately 700 points with this particular one. You can have some options here or there to assemble things differently. So, for example, the Chaos Chariot can also be assembled as a Gore Beast Chariot or something along those lines, which costs 10 points more. But generally speaking, you're getting 700 points with this one, and we're going to go over the list in a little bit as well, in a little bit more detail. But yeah, overall, this box gives you a full regiment. It works on its own. It gives you all the basic units you need to start a decent Slaves to Darkness army, and you're getting a lot of points for your money. 700 is one third of your army, basically, and expanding that is very, very easy because you can just buy whatever leader choice you want, whatever units that leader choice can put into their regiment, and you're good to go which is a great starting point from just a first impressions kind of perspective. So with the summary out of the way, let's take a look at the detailed list of this particular spearhead box. As you can see, 700 points. A lot of these points are allocated to your Chaos Warriors and your Chaos Knights, but that works out nicely because both of those units are pretty dang strong on their own. And you're obviously going to run two five-man squads in spearhead instead of a 10-man squad in full Age of Sigmar. Another thing to keep in mind is that Age of Sigmar and the designers for 4th edition were very conservative as far as points go, so that usually whenever they need to make changes to a faction, it usually means that they can make units cheaper rather than having to make them more expensive. So while you might think then, you know, 200 points for 10 Chaos Warriors seems like a lot, it's actually fine in full AOS, although I only played the two 2000 points games with Slaves to Darkness until now, so uh, your mileage may vary. But Overall, I think getting 700 points for your money is a ton, and I think it works out nicely as its own regiment. Now, the pricing is going to be the same as for all the different spearheads. They all have the same price point at £90, €115, Euros, $145, and so on. For Australia, this is one of the slightly cheaper boxes at 220 Australian, so that is maybe making it a little bit more attractive for, you know, a little bit more budget-orientated players over there. As far as the units go, the Chaos Lord and the Chaos Chariot are slightly older models, and thus the Chaos Lord is quite cheap in Australia. Older models just tend to be cheaper even than over in Canada. So yeah, that makes sense. The Chaos Chariot is also a slightly older model, so you're going to kind of figure out why they are so much cheaper than the Chaos Warriors and the Chaos Knights. Overall, you're going to be saving between 28 and 30%, which I consider these days to be the average. A few years ago, the average was approximately 33%, so the boxes have degraded a little bit as far as value goes, but honestly, 30% is not horrible at all. And as I said, if all the other things are great, which, spoiler, they are, uh, this box is still very much worth it. And we are also going to discuss whether this box is worth it to be picked up once, twice, or multiple times, because, as I said, it's a neutral force. You could pick it up twice to get to 1,400 points right then and there, have two regiments going and then upgrade it to 2,000 points with units that you personally like, for example, Abraxia and so on. Next up, we are going to take a look at the Slaves to Darkness Bloodwind Legion Spearhead rule set. You're going to find the link to that specific PDF down in the pinned comment below. You'll have to scroll all the way down to page 55 to get to those rules, so just keep that in mind whenever you open the PDF. 
As you can see on the left hand side of this particular image, you're going to be running this particular list the way it is described here. So you're going to have your Chaos Lord, one chariot, two squads of five Chaos Warriors and five Chaos Knights. And all of it is hitting the table on turn one. That is very important. Also, you're not going to get any reinforcements in this particular list because that would make this entire box even more busted than it already is. And yeah, with that, let's take a look at the rules because in my opinion, this is one of the stronger spearheads and it's probably S tier when it comes to just the rules itself. So first up, you have your battle traits. You have the eyes of the gods, which basically allows you to roll on the table on the right hand side if you satisfy one of the two conditions listed on the left hand side. A unit is contesting an objective not controlled by your opponent and is not in combat or a unit that destroyed an enemy unit this turn. And then you roll on the die table and then you figure out what you get. You can get nothing if you roll a one or you can roll a six and pick whatever is required from you right then and there. Overall, I think this table is pretty decent. Getting a conditional ward six up can always be useful. Add one to run rolls for a unit is probably the worst one and it's very close to not getting anything because usually you don't want to run. You want to move up and charge. The table is super small and running without being able to charge sucks. In Spirit in particular, it's completely useless. I would have much preferred adding one to charge rolls at this point. Then you have Blessing of Nurgle. Subtract one from wound rolls for attacks that target this unit. This is probably the strongest one. I would rate it higher than a ward of six up simply because minus one to wound is very strong, especially against armies like elves, uh, which are only wounding on fours. So then wounding on fives is horrible for them. So the blessing of Nurgle has things that you have to keep in mind whenever you roll a six. Against elves, I would always pick number four in that case. And then you have Fury of Corn if you roll a five, add one to the rent characteristic of this unit's melee weapons. So in general, to summarize it, this ability is very strong. You can activate it by satisfying one of the two conditions, which are very easy to satisfy, in my opinion. And you're going to get a very strong bonus. Uh, yeah, basically 66% of the time. Only rolling a three and a one is bad. Everything else is pretty dang decent. And the last thing to mention that is probably quite interesting and important is that these effects are permanent. So once you roll one of these effects, so for example, if your Chaos Knights, for example, get a six up ward because you roll a two, that effect is permanent. They are not commutative. So you, if you roll a two again for the same unit, nothing happens, but you can theoretically speaking, roll a two, three, four, and five and gain all of these effects on a single or multiple units. And with that, let's take a look at the regiment abilities because some of them interact with our army ability or battle trait. The first one is the Dread Banner. You use it once per battle at the start of the first battle round, so you don't have any flexibility there. And it declares that you pick one Chaos Warriors or Chaos Knights unit and you can immediately roll on the Eye of the Gods table for that unit. As I mentioned earlier, it's a clear gamble that you're going into the game with, with the Regiment ability, the Dread Banner, simply because, in my opinion at least, 33% of the options that you could possibly roll are bad. You can roll a 1, which is obviously, there's no contest there, it's just a bad effect, because nothing happens, it's basically wasted. And the Grace of Slanesh is, in my opinion, very rarely useful unless your opponent uh, just kind of castles their entire army in one singular corner and one unit has no option at all to charge into anything. And that happens very rarely. So overall, the Dread Banner, I can absolutely see this being good, especially if you like gambling and um, if you feel lucky. But overall, I think it's worse than the other option you have. Fierce Conqueror, meanwhile, is a passive and it says add three to the control scores of friendly Chaos Warriors units. That means that effectively speaking, you have plus six control score on the table for two of your Chaos Warriors units, and it has a direct effect, no negatives here, no gambling, and it's just good. Especially considering that you have very few models and having additional control is very, very important for this particular list. So in my opinion, Fierce Conquerors is the clear choice here in almost all cases, but if you feel lucky, or if you feel like your opponent is playing a weaker spirit than you are with this particular one, you can go for the Dread Banner and just challenge luck a little bit and see what happens. Next up, we are going to be talking about the enhancements. While I had a clear favorite for the cool boys, I don't have a clear favorite here at all. 
I think all of them have their use cases. They're all very strong. And depending on the matchup, depending on how you feel, um, who's setting up when and so on, you could make a case for all four of them. So just giving a clear recommendation which one you should always go with is going to be difficult, although I'm going to try. So the first one on the top left hand side is the Mark of Corn. Add one to the rent characteristic of your general's melee weapons if they've charged in the same turn. So that turns your Chaos Lord's weapon into a rent 2 weapon with 2 damage, which is pretty strong on 5 attacks. Then you have the passive Mark of Nurgle. Subtract 1 from wound rolls for combat attacks that target your general. In my opinion, this is the default choice that you should always go with if you have no idea what to pick, simply because keeping your general alive because of the buffs he's distributing, because of the attacks he has and so on, is going to be your main priority. And if you are a new player or an inexperienced player, this one is going to be way more forgiving than any of the other choices you can see here. So if you are new or whether, or if you are just unsure what to pick, the Mark of Nurgle is, in my opinion, the safe pick here. Then you have the Mark of Tsinj, which allows you to pick one friendly unit. You pick it off the battlefield and then you can position it somewhere on the battlefield wholly within six of your general. And it can't move, but you can still charge and so on. So it enables you a little bit of repositioning shenanigans, which also has its use cases. And the Mark of Slanesh gives you Strike First, which is also very strong because that gives your Chaos Lord also protection. And it lets you kind of play around with the turn order a little bit. And it allows your Chaos Lord to be a little bit more aggressive than he would be otherwise. So as I said, all of four of them are very, very strong, have their use cases. And yeah, as I said, if you are confused what to pick, if you are completely new, pick the Mark of Nurgle. It's the safest one. But all of the other ones have their cases as well. Mark of Tsinj requires a little bit more game knowledge and game feel. You have to know whether you have to reposition or whether you gain something from repositioning your unit. And, you know, in some cases, strike first, especially into a very aggressive and very melee-focused army, like, for example, the Korn uh, Spearhead, is very useful in that case. And sometimes you want rent. For example, you wouldn't pick rent against Nighthaunt because they ignore it anyway. And that's where the Mark of Khan doesn't make any sense. But some armies, like for example, a mirror match, in that case, getting an additional rent would be very, very strong because, you know, most of your army has a three up safe. Reducing that to a five up is very strong. So as I said, all four of them, excellent. And then a quick overview over the separate models. First up is the Chaos Lord. As I teased earlier, he is a beat stick, a very hefty one, five attacks, three to hit, three to wound, one rent, two damage, and crit mortals on top of that is quite strong. Then you have favorite of the Pantheon, uh, roll a dice on a four up, you can roll on the eyes of the god table for this unit. Uh, in your hero phase, you use this, and this is going to make your Chaos Lord very, very strong. And if you have the Mark of Nurgle, your Chaos Lord is going to stay on the table for a little bit longer and make use of this ability more often. That's just how it goes, and that's why I recommended the Mark of Nurgle, generally speaking. So, favorite of the Pantheon, very strong. Iron Will Champion, you pick one unit wholly within 12 inches, you cannot pick the Lord himself, and you roll a 2-up, and if you do, uh, you add one to the hit rolls for attacks made by target unit that you picked. So you can pick your chariot, you can pick your warriors or knights, and they get plus one to hit, and that makes him a useful buffing piece as well. So not only is he going to get stronger as the game progresses, not only is he strong and tanky with six health, three save, and a strong weapon, but he also supports your other units. This Chaos Lord is incredible. Then you have your chariot. This is probably the weakest model in this particular box simply because it has no rent, as you can see. It has a lot of attacks, but those attacks are generally just low quality. And people are very scared of the chariot, but once they see the war scroll, they quickly understand oh, okay, it's basically just a filler unit because you have seven health, which is not a lot for such a big base. You have a four up save for some unexplicable reason. I would have really wanted this one to have a three up save, but it is what it is. And then you have all of these rent zero weapons, which are fine. You're hitting some of them on three threes, some of them on four fours, some of them on five threes. It's fine. And then you have a swift death. So whenever you charge a unit on a two up, you inflict D3 mortal wounds on a target. And that's fine, but this unit is probably going to charge, attack once, and then die. That's how it went for me in most of my seven games. And it's just a filler unit. It is there to soak up a little bit of damage from your opponent and uh, to distract them. And that's what it does really well. 
Then we have our Chaos Warriors. These are your bread and butter unit. Two health, three up save, very durable. They have two attacks at 3 3, rent one, damage one. And they have a very useful ability in Bringers of Desolation because you can add one to the wound roll for combat attacks made by this unit that target an enemy unit that is contesting an objective you do not control. That means that you can effectively have your Chaos Warriors, if the Lord is nearby, hit on twos and wound on twos. And it is demoralizing in and of itself. Because if I tell my opponent, yeah, I'm hitting on twos and wounding on twos, they are flabbergasted, especially in Spearhead. And yeah, it is as scary as you think. You know, having 10 attacks, 2-2 two, two, potentially, rent one, damage one, is very, very strong on a very tanky unit. The Chaos Warriors are pretty good. If you pick the Red Domain ability that gives them additional control, they are actually going to be able to hold objectives as well and contest them against armies that are a little bit more numerous talking about Night Haunt here and so on. So yeah, Chaos Warriors overall a very, very strong unit and they are going to do a lot of good for you in Spearhead. Last but not least, we have the Chaos Knights. They work very similarly to all of the cavalry, which is to say if you start your game and if you can move them up, you have a much bigger advantage over your opponent than you would otherwise. If your Chaos Knights get charged, they are suddenly quite weak. So you have five bases here with four health and a three up save, which is pretty beefy, but they really benefit from getting a charge off. So you get plus one damage when you charge and you add one to the rent characteristic of this unit's cursed lenses if it charged in the same turn. And that makes a massive difference for them. Um, so yeah, if you cannot charge or if you are not starting the game, definitely position him as far away from your opponent as you can. So they get a little bit of movement in because 10 inches basically means they get to charge from wherever they are and then, you know, get them into a charging position and get those ran two damage to attacks off. And at that point, they are going to be very strong. If your opponent charges them on turn one, you are in a lot of trouble. Just keep that in mind and they are going to be great at what they are doing because once they charge, they basically kill whatever they charged into. So yeah, in summary, this particular Spearhead is very strong, in my opinion, one of the strongest ones. The only ones that got me in a little bit of trouble were the Ogre ones, for example, and the Indrasta uh, Stormcast Eternal ones. But obviously, I need to play way more games to give a super conclusive opinion on all of these. There's going to be probably a tier list video once I've reviewed more of these boxes. But for now, my opinion is that this box is quite strong. Now, as far as upgrades go, this is going to be very, very difficult because you can basically buy whatever you want because the Spirit is its self-contained regiment. If you like the models that you see, you could technically buy this one twice if you wanted to get to 2,000 points quickly and as cheaply as possible. And you would be sitting at 1,400 points, two for regiments, and then you could buy separate kits, like for example, Abraxia and her box, if you can find it, I strongly recommend it. And then you could get easily to 2,000 points and run that as for as little money as possible. That would be absolutely fine. You could also buy whatever you want, build your own regiments and go from there. So making clear recommendations is quite difficult. But the Abraxia box, I strongly recommend if you can find it. It's a very rare and was a very popular box that released a few months ago, like one or two months ago. And yeah, if you can find it in some kind of LGS, get it. The same applies to last year's Battle Force, if you can find that one. That one was not as popular, but I think, especially in 4th edition, it gained a lot of ground. Most of the units included in there are quite strong. So if you wanted to get this one, or if you find this one for a good price, uh, ideally MSRP or below, definitely worth a pickup, and it's a great upgrade to this particular Spearhead. So there are lots of options to consider, but basically you have all the options with this one. You are not locked into any specific playstyle with this box, and you are free to do whatever you want. And I think that's one of the greatest things that you can get out of a spearhead because it allows you to just pick it up twice, get whatever other value box GW is releasing or is going to release in the future. Maybe we are going to get another Slaves to Darkness Battle Force this Christmas, who knows? Or you could just go out and buy whatever you find cool separately. I, for example, am running this spearhead twice and some Ogre Theridons together with their leader choice and so on in its own regiment. And I think it works perfectly. It's not the most competitive list, but it's definitely fun. And yeah, that's basically all there is to say about this one. So I strongly recommend this box. I think it's great. A perfect starting point for your Slaves to Darkness army. And it allows you to do basically anything you want as far as upgrading your list goes. And in Spearhead, it's definitely one of the stronger boxes 
I would definitely put it in top three or maybe top five as far as power level goes for now. With that, if you have any questions, drop them down in the comments below. If you have anything to add, if you are a Slaves to Darkness veteran or something, definitely drop your knowledge and uh, any kind of hints and tips you have in the comments below. And other than that, I hope this video was insightful and I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.